Hey, Introduction to Physics students. We are back here for flipped lesson number two. Today we're going to be talking about energy in simple harmonic motion, damped oscillations, and resonance. And this will actually finish off the first third of this unit. So the first third of this unit is all about the simple harmonic motion. The second third, we're going to get into the concept of waves and sound. The third third, we're going to get into the concept of waves interfering. And these are all some unique things that uh, we'll be getting over or get into the, over the next uh, couple weeks here uh, as we're in quarantine. Now, before you watch this lecture, you should complete lab two, damped and driven oscillations. Um, and it also has some stuff with um, energy um, as well, but it's energy and damped oscillations. So uh, there are three procedures with this lab. Uh, taking a look at the period with the damped oscillation, taking a look at the energy with damped oscillation, and taking a look at a, a video about driven oscillations, um, and kind of a couple interesting things with that. So make sure you complete that before you watch this video. Okay, so the first thing that we want to tackle, we actually tackled in the first lab a little bit, and that's this concept of energy and simple harmonic motion. Now on the left side here, I have a um, horizontal oscillator. So we've talked about this, how it oscillates back and forth between uh, these two points. Uh, the point from um, the midpoint to the outside, the furthest away point, right? That's our amplitude. And we have that on both sides. And it goes back and forth. And the, and the time that it takes to go back and forth is the period. And that's going to be 2 pi times the square root of, in this case, it's all oscillator. So it's m over k, right? We talked about this already. So it's oscillating back and forth. And um, not only can we look at it oscillating back and forth, but we can also look at its energy as it's oscillating back and forth. So using some concepts that we've already learned um, and, and try to help, out, help us explain what's going on. Now, when it's all the way on its right-hand side or all the way on its left-hand side, then at that exact moment, we kind of talked about this a little bit already, the velocity at that moment is zero. At those, I should say at those moments, at zero. And the reason that it's zero is because we're either at the amplitude we're at the amplitude from either direction, which means that all of our energy at this, we'll call this point one, let's see, that's just two, three, four, and five. So at point one and point five, all of our energy is elastic potential energy. So on uh, image B here, if I look at um, what would be equivalent to point one and point five is right here, and right here. So those two points, we have 100% potential energy. Now, what about point three? Now at point three, right, we're at the midpoint, we're at equilibrium. Remember talking about equilibrium? So at point three, we're at equilibrium, which means that I don't have a stretched spring. I have all kinetic energy. There's no potential energy, we're all kinetic energy. And point three then, is right here. Zero potential energy, all kinetic energy. And as we have a simple harmonic motion, um, we have a fluctuation between potential and kinetic energy. So at points four and two, right, it's some combination of potential and kinetic energy. So I'll, I'll go ahead and highlight those in green right here. At points two and point four, we have some fluctuation of potential and kinetic energy. Now, a couple things to note though, there is a red bar on this line, kind of reddish, yeah. Um, and that's the total energy. And the total energy you can see is never changing. So we're gonna talk about that just a little bit more in terms of describing it, because that actually helps us get a couple more equations to help quantify um, simple harmonic motion. So, if we're oscillating back and forth, when um, the object is at rest, either at the positive amplitude or at the negative amplitude. If the object is at rest, that potential energy is at its maximum amount and the kinetic energy is zero. At its equilibrium position, which is right here, at equilibrium position, the kinetic energy is at a maximum 
and the potential energy is at zero. So we can actually set up a couple formulas or a couple equations um, to understand that. So potential energy, we've talked about elastic potential energy before, and that's one half kx squared. Now we've also talked about kinetic energy before, and that's one half mv squared. So we have these two equations, which means that at any point, the, our total energy is always gonna be the sum of the kinetic and the potential, and that is gonna be kinetic is one half mv squared, potential is one half kx squared, and this is always going to be some constant number. And I call this a non-zero constant. It's always some non-zero constant number. And that's just by utilizing the concept of the conservation of energy at any given point. Now, there are a couple of main points of interest. And uh, we can use those to further help us describe simple harmonic motion. And that is this point slash this point or this point. At those two points, we again, we have this either purely uh, potential or purely kinetic. So let's take a look at those real quick. So if we're all the way outside, if we're at our maximum amplitude, which is these two points, our kinetic energy, we know at that point, kinetic energy is zero. We don't have to worry about it, which means that 100% of our energy is potential energy. And we know that potential energy is one half kx squared. Wow, that was a great k. But instead, at this point, instead of using x, x is how far we're displaced from equilibrium. Well, we're displaced the amplitude away. So we have this new formula, one half ka squared. So I'll call this u max. The maximum kinetic energy is one half k, not x squared, but a squared because it's at the amplitude. Now at equilibrium, which is, let me change colors real quick here, at equilibrium right here, we know that potential energy equals zero. So at equilibrium, all of the energy is kinetic. And instead of just kinetic energy, which we know is one half mv squared, um, we can say that it's one half m v max squared. And that concept of v max came back, so k max is one half m v max squared. We talked about that concept of v max in the last section when we get into the quantification with the sine and cosine graphs. Uh, we know that the velocity is a function of v max. So if we wanted to get really quantitative with that, we do have that available for us. So I am actually going to destroy your lives real quick, and I'm going to make all these equations into one. So we know that energy is always kinetic plus potential, which is one half mv squared plus one half kx squared. But it also, it also equals u max which is one half k a squared. It also equals k max, which is one half m v max squared. And that always, all of those always equal some non zero constant. And that might be a little bit confusing, but that's like the statement. Remember how we did this with um, with the impulse momentum theorem, right? Where I said, oh, J equals impulse equals F delta T equals area under, under the force versus time graph equals M delta V equals MBF, right? All those. This is the same thing. It's one equation that really sums up everything. But this gets back. It all brings us back to something we t studied earlier in the year, and that is the conservation of energy. And with the conservation of energy, energy always has to be conserved. And with a simple harmonic oscillator, uh, we always go back and forth between kinetic and potential. So it has to obey the law of conservation of energy. Cool. So I just wanted to summarize that for you real quick. Sorry if I made your life miserable.
All right, so we can also use these equations to actually continue to make more equations because why, why else would we exist in physics if not, if not for making more and more equations? So because of the conservation of energy, I can also set k max equal to u max. And if I do that, I can get my own little equation for the maximum velocity, which I needed in the previous um, section. Um, I had a different way of solving it, but this is another way of solving it. And this also helps us um, better understand the equation of uh, frequency and period. So just a couple further ways to help us explain or quantify what's going on with this type of motion, which of course, physics is the quantification and explanation of the phenomenon of life. So the more equations we have, the better, right? That's, I know that's what's going on through all of your minds. And this also helps us understand more about the frequency then. So if we're looking at a spring, a horizontal oscillator, because of this concept of energy, if we have a high frequency, that means we either have a stiff spring or a low mass. If we have a low frequency, we have a soft spring or a high mass. So this helps us um, understand more what's going on with the concept of a linear oscillator. Now, what we just talked about <clears throat> was in a frictionless situation. Of course, that is not real life. And the reason we try to stick to this is because the math gets a little harder when we talk about real life. So we got to understand it in the theoretical situation before we can talk about the next application, which is a damped oscillation. And a damped oscillation is what I like to call a real life oscillation. And you, that's, this is what you focused primarily on in your, in your lab today <clears throat> or whenever you did the lab. So an oscillation that runs down and eventually stops, and I'm going to highlight stops there because um, technically, mathematically, with the representation that we have, it doesn't actually ever stop, but obviously it actually stops. So anything that slows down, an oscillation that slows down and eventually stops is called a damped oscillation. Now let's think about a pendulum. In a pendulum, we actually have a very low friction situation, but we do have air resistance. Now the drag force isn't very powerful. If you recall, which you probably don't, the drag force of course is one half rho drag coefficient cross-sectional area times velocity squared. Our velocity is quite small. Our cross-sectional area is quite small. So we don't actually encompass a lot of drag force, but as it persists over a long amount of time, we do get some drag force. And if I think about that, when is, my, when is this amount the greatest? Well, when my velocity is the greatest. So right when my oscillation starts, this drag force is at its greatest amount. Therefore, the rate at which it decays is the greatest. And as the oscillation decays, the rate of decay decreases. So therefore, as it's going back and forth, you should have seen uh, in the simulation, right? You pulled that back to 45 degrees. The first few cycles, it dramatically decreases. The amplitude dramatically decreases. Now, the first section of the lab wasn't about the amplitude though, right? It was about the period. And what did you notice about the period as it goes back and forth? the period should not have changed. But anyway, the amplitude or the angle that it goes back to does change. So if you didn't see that, definitely go back to that procedure one uh, when we're taking a look at the uh, FET simulation. And as we watch it, as we have that friction turned on, I'm gonna actually run it real quick and uh, I'm gonna bring it up to 45 degrees. And the first time it comes back, it comes back to close it, it i mean it's it's losing probably about a degree and a half to two degrees every time that it comes back and forth but when we get way to the end as we're as we're like you know three minutes in it's it's just moving back and forth to pretty much close to the same amount and that is because it is a damped oscillation and the rate of decay decreases so mathematically let's take a look at this picture on the right this is a horizontal oscillator going back and forth, right? It starts at the amplitude. And as it's re first released, notice how it doesn't quite 
get to its amplitude because it's already losing energy as soon as you release it. By losing energy of me, uh, of course, I don't mean losing energy. I mean, it's becoming unusable like friction. So as it oscillates back and forth, the, the amplitude itself or how far it's making it out is decreasing. But notice something else. From peak to peak to peak, those time intervals are evenly spaced. So the period stays the same. The period is a consequence of either if it's a pendulum, right? It's the square root of L over G. If it's a uh, horizontal oscillator, it's the square root of m over k, right? 2 pi times that. So the period is a function of the length of the string or gravity if it's a pendulum, the mass on the oscillator or the spring constant if it's a spring. So the period itself doesn't change, but the amplitude is going to change. So we do have a formula for this. And this formula says at, this ex at whatever exact second, the maximum displacement that it can be is equal to the initial amplitude times e e if you haven't seen e a lot in a math class it's used to to represent exponential growth and decay quite often uh, we see it in biology class we see it in chemistry class we see it in social studies because we're talking about population growth right so that's where e really comes in it's a logarithmic function and uh to the negative t over uh, that is the Greek letter tau, just like torque, except now we're dealing with time constants. So E uh, to the negative T over tau helps describe how rapidly the, uh, the oscillation decays. So a damped oscillation is that. Now, if I were to look at that in picture B here, what I can see is this is the A to the negative T over tau line. That means at any given point, that is the, the red line now represents the maximum theoretical um, displacement. Now, it's kind of weird because what if I'm, I'm right here, I'm in middle of an oscillation, I'm at equilibrium. Well, I still have at that time a maximum theoretical displacement, even though my position at that time is zero. So this max position is not the same as the position as a function of time. It's slightly different. If that's confusing... That, that's okay. Uh, it, it, there are two different things. There's the position as a function of time, right? A cosine uh, 2 pi f t. And then there's the maximum theoretical position. And these two don't aren't necessarily the same thing. If that doesn't make sense, that, that's okay. It's getting a little deep into physics. That's probably a little bit beyond, beyond where our, our understanding lies. And that's okay. So that is our formula for that. Uh, here's a quick little summary of that. So exponential decay is what's occurring here. It's a to the negative t over tau. And uh, it as it decays over many time constants, here's one time constant, here's two time constants, right? As it decays, um, y, the initial or the, uh, the amplitude or the position becomes very close and approaches zero. Now, here's the problem with this. With a logarithmic function, it never actually hits zero. So as I watch my uh, pendulum lab go over many successive periods, it, I mean this thing on a on a simulation, it probably lasts. I mean I didn't I don't I didn't time the whole thing, but it probably lasts like a good I don't know ten minutes. But eventually, the amplitudes will be become so small that it's unnoticeable, and therefore we say that it stopped. But mathematically, our math doesn't actually back that up. Our math says it goes forever, which is, of course, not true. So mathematically, the oscillation never ceases. However, the amplitude will become so small that it's undetectable. So time constant tau is the lifetime of the oscillation. It, it describes the physical setup. Now, our formula for tau is nothing. We don't actually have a formula for um, determining what the time constant is for an oscillation. And the reason for that is it's kind of like a coefficient of friction. The only way that I can determine it is by making a table of values by performing experiments. So although it is, it is represented as a variable, 
I don't actually have a way for solving for. But I do know that if tau is very, very small compared to the period, the oscillation will go many periods and last a long time. If tau is very large compared to the period, the oscillation is going to damp quite rapidly. We have one last uh, section in here, and that is the opposite of a damped oscillation, and that is a driven oscillation. And the last chunk of the lab uh, was really you just watching a video. I think it's a kind of a cool video. He makes a giant air horn, right? And um, he does a, a really good job of explaining the concept of driven oscillations in a few different ways. He uses that jello mold, and then he talks about like the concept of impedance matching. And then he's got his like niece on a swing, and I'm pretty sure that was the last time he was allowed near a playground. So he is pushing his niece on a swing. Now his, I think it's his niece, right? I'm pretty sure it's his niece. Now, if she starts at rest, she is essentially, she's a pendulum. Now, if she starts at rest, she doesn't have the, any ability. Her amplitude at that point is zero. If she's not pumping her legs, which uh, pumping your legs when you're swinging, that's another example of impedance matching and also changing the instantaneous center of gravity as it relates to the pivot point. It's phenomenal uh, how physics-y that is. But um, we're we're not gonna we're not gonna get into that right now. We can have another side conversation some other time about swinging, on a swing set. So, she starts at rest. Now he has to push her, and as he pushes her, he is exerting a force right over a distance, aka he's doing work. That work causes an increase in potential energy because he's pushing her up or it's causing an increase in kinetic energy because he's making her go faster. So that work is going into both things and he is therefore increasing not only that, but he's increasing the energy in the system. So as he produces an outside force, he is pushing energy into the system. Now, a couple things about that though. There is a natural frequency of the girl right, of her being on a uh, pendulum, right, so 1 over 2 pi, uh, there it is, times the square root of g over l, she has her own natural frequency. Now, he has to push her, he pushes her at the driving frequency, and this driving frequency, it doesn't have to be exactly the same as the natural frequency, but it has to match up in order to correctly add energy into the system. And he talks about this in the video. He says, what happens if I just randomly push her, right? The amplitude of the pendulum, because that's what she is, it doesn't increase. He has to push her at the right rate, which is known as the driving frequency. And that driving frequency has to match up with the natural frequency in order for a driven oscillation to occur. So, what does this all mean? If you're on the swing set, if you re release them like a pendulum, they would swing but eventually stop. That is a damped oscillation. However, if someone else is pushing them on the swing, they are putting energy into the system, either back into the system or even more. That person is providing the driving frequency. If they do it wrong, uh, the driving frequency will kind of collide with the natural frequency. But if they do it right, it'll, it'll add together and then it'll, it'll increase the overall amplitude. So we can get into some other things with this. Uh, one of the demos that I do in class quite often that you can feel free to check out online is the concept of a, um, like the wine glasses. And, and when you like, swirl your finger around the wine glass it gets super loud and that's because the wine glass has its own unique frequency and you can actually um, increase or decrease the amount of liquid in it to change the to change the pitch and change the frequency um, but as we it has its own natural frequency and it has its own resonance with that so as we um, twirl our finger around the top of the wine glass their wine glass has a certain response curve. Now, if we match that with our frequency, we get a greater amplitude. So the amplitude can become very, very large when the frequencies match, especially if there's not a lot of damping. So we'll talk about this a little bit more during the, uh, the next thirds of this unit, uh, but that is what's going on. We have this extra amplitude because of this natural resonance with, this, with these frequencies. This is how um, 
your ears work. Um, so your eardrum vibrates back and forth, right? It vibrates back and forth. And that um, corresponds to the uh, uh, an attachment into the cochlea, which is like a uh, this, it's part of your inner ear that senses these vibrations. And different areas in the cochlea, like right here versus right here, respond or they resonate with different frequencies. And those cause... Um, vibrations based on this if you think about this linearly this is your it actually thins out over time so if you're an ap psych i think you talk about this but if you don't understand everything about the inner ear that's totally fine but different points in your inner ear correspond to different frequencies and those different frequencies resonate with different frequencies as they hit your eardrum and those send signals to your brain so you perceive sound so here it is kind of kind of drawn out for you. Again, different parts of your cochlea respond to different frequencies. So um, the, the sound waves that are produced um, are picked up by different areas. And actually, as you get older, your response curve uh, dies off. So it, it used to be a thing back, back when I was in high school and cell phones were strictly confiscated. It was a state law that you were not allowed to have a cell phone at school. Um, of course, I may or may not have had my flip phone with me, and uh, but people would get these these uh, these ringtones that were super super high frequency, like in the term of like eighteen thousand hertz. So these super high frequencies. Uh, if you want to know what eighteen thousand hertz is, go ahead and Google. Go to Google. Oops, I spelled that wrong. Google uh, frequency generator. And if you Google frequency generator, the there's like this one, hold on, let me Google it for you real quick. There's this frequent, the, uh, there's the second result for me, there's an ad and the second result is online tone generator, generate pure tones of any frequency. I always use that one. Um, go ahead, it's, it starts off at 440 Hertz. Go ahead and type in 18,000, right? And then hit play. Uh, make sure your speakers are are not on full volume, but um, it's super super high pitched and super super annoying. But the reason students did that is because as you get older, your response to these higher frequencies dips off. So we'll talk about this more later. But the average human has twenty to twenty thousand hertz of a response range. Now, as you get older, that that gets maybe it's thirty-five to seventeen thousand, and then it's sixty to fourteen thousand, right? I don't know. This is just arbitrary, but your frequency response dips. So the students will get these high frequency ringtones so that they could hear their um, ringtone without the teacher hearing it, because the teacher is, of course, older. So your homework, uh, you got to complete homework week two. There's a couple of ranking tasks and just one problem. Um, so by the end of this week, you should have lab two done. You should have energy, uh, the graphic organizer that went around with this notes done, and of course the homework week two. So uh, not bad for week two. Uh, good luck getting everything completed, and let me know if you have any questions.